Hi, and welcome to Good or Bad. Now, could you all do me a favour and just pretend it's Friday the 13th? Because I'm doing a Friday the 13th. And the last Friday the 13th movie I did was part four, the final chapter. So does that make this one part five, the epilogue? And then part six can be epilogue two, return of the killer epilogue. Okay, jokes aside. The studio couldn't stop at part four, the final chapter, because money. So naturally, if you call part five a new beginning, it's all fine. And yet, despite this movie's name, it is just more of the same. Well, I say the same. There is one difference. Jason stays dead. Because remember in the final chapter, Jason died. Like, really died. Not kinda died, but really very actually died. And they don't bring him back. So instead of the real Jason, we get a mysterious new Jason-like figure. So let me get this straight. This movie is the first sequel and the only sequel in the series not to bring Jason back from the previous movie, which is technically an original idea. By definition, that's original. However, what they do instead of bringing Jason back is have a Jason imposter that just goes around and does what Jason would be doing if he was in the movie. Now I have to hand it to this movie, that is the most unoriginal way I could possibly see an original idea being executed. And that's just mind-bogglingly impressive. But anyway, how does this movie set itself up? The film has Tommy Jarvis in it. You know, the kid that killed Jason. Except he is all grown up now, and is played by John Shepard. Well, for the most part, Corey Feldman does pop up in the intro. In a nightmare sequence, where we see Jason rise from the grave. And to be fair, it is a pretty decent scene. It has some cool visuals, and it is nice to see Feldman return briefly as Jarvis. I also like it because in the first three sequels, this is where the recap scene would have been. And they were just scenes from the previous movies half-assedly shoved into the new movie to recap the audience. Yes, to recap the audience of the gripping and complex story of Friday the 13th. I'm sorry, I love these movies, I do. But they are not complicated. People fuck, people die, then Jason gets defeated, rinse and repeat. But this movie doesn't have that recap, and it's the first sequel in the series not to do so. Instead, this uses newly created scenes and naturally placed dialogue to tell us what is going on. I mean, good god, imagine if other movie franchises did this. Oh no wait, they all do. Guess Friday the 13th was just late to the party with this one. Still. Got there in the end. So Tommy's life ever since, to put it simply, it's been a bit shit really. And now he moves into this place, which is a youth development centre. Which is quite a different experience for Tommy compared to the mental health institutes he has been in and out of since he was a kid. The movie explains that Tommy has been on several different drugs and treatment programmes that haven't really been working for him, but this place ditches all of that in favour of a bit of fresh air and rehabilitation in a family-like environment. I guess they felt a sense of normalcy might help him. But in any case, I think Shepard does a pretty good job portraying his disturbed and paranoid nature, and we get a fair few decent scenes displaying just that. Not very verbal scenes, but it's the expressions on his face and the fact that he flips out over the slightest thing. Now what I do not like is the fact that partway through the movie, the film just ditches him in favour of Pam, who is the final girl of the movie, and she is played by Melanie Kinnaman. Now don't get me wrong, I like Pam, I have nothing against Pam, but why doesn't Tommy get any decent scenes with fake Jason? I mean, Tommy just seems to hang around throughout the movie, showing how paranoid he is, while people watching are just waiting for him to confront the new Jason. And when he does, all he does is stare at him and get stabbed. He lives, but he doesn't actually do much else. Actually, hang on, 
he does stab not Jason, which does make him fall to his death. I mean, does that even count for anything? He already killed the real Jason. Helping kill a copycat is a bit of a step backwards after that, in my opinion. You have to reach for newer, bigger, and better things. He is such a has-been. Now, reasons. Reasony, reasony, reason. Stop being weird. Why is the copycat killer doing what he's doing? What triggers this new series of killings? It all goes back to the start of the movie. Obviously. Joey here, who was a guy with a chocolate bar, lived with everyone in the Pinehurst Youth Development Centre, and the movie pictures him as a rather annoying person. Then he annoys the wrong person. Yeah, so the first death of the movie award doesn't go to fake Jason, it goes to angry guy with axe. Well done, sir. You win a chocolate bar right there on the floor by the corpse. And this is where we meet who is revealed at the end of the movie to be the killer, Roy the Paramedic. Which is a truly terrifying name. And after Joey's death he turns up and has to remove his body. But what we don't know during this scene is that Joey was Roy's son. I don't think anyone else knew it either. If they did it was a bit inconsiderate asking him to carry the body away. But yeah, he goes insane and dresses up like Jason Voorhees, and goes on a revenge-driven killing spree to avenge the death of his son. And it mirrors the original movie, with Pamela Voorhees having the exact same reason. Not that it's as good as the original movie, but it's still a nice touch. So there you have it. That's the reason for the fake Jason. But why would he choose Jason? Well, I guess he wanted to get away with it, and it was as good a disguise as any. Maybe he thought they would just think Jason was back or something. I mean, he does have a bit of a track record when it comes to coming back from the dead. Even as early as this film is in the series, he has come back from three deaths. So that's not a bad reveal because it makes sense, and there are hints throughout the movie that there is more to Roy than meets the eye. Because no one knows Joey is Roy's son, but he looks freaked out during this scene. Initially, we believe it could be because he doesn't like dead bodies, or it looks too gruesome. Then when we find out that Joey was his son, that reaction makes a lot more sense. So that scene was clearly a hint, therefore it wasn't completely out of the blue when he was revealed to be the killer. I honestly can't fault any part of the fact that he was the fake Jason. So this movie is essentially a whodunit story. And while I usually enjoy that kind of story, I didn't enjoy it here. Because I had no idea it was a whodunit story. I just assumed it was Jason back from the dead, like every other bloody movie with Jason in it. So I got no fun from trying to figure out who the killer was in this movie. Because I had no idea I could have been trying to figure out who the killer was in this movie. Oops. As for the characters, I rather liked them. Now we've already mentioned Tommy, and Pam was nice, and some of the others were good too. I liked Reggie, he was a cool character. Lots of fun, and had quite a bit of personality to him. His brother was also entertaining as briefly as he was on the screen. Poor guy. He died while having a shit. That's just not nice. I mean, he's nothing sacred anymore. We also had these two people who were a bit odd. These Friday the 13th movies do like their oddballs, don't they? <laughs> don't you just love it when a movie tries to make something memorable by making it stupid? This brings me on to the death scenes, which aren't the best in the series, but aren't the worst either. They are just okay. That's it really, just okay. But what is better than okay is the set design and the cinematography. That's one thing that is very consistent in Friday the 13th. The production values are good, and certain aspects just seem to carry over from sequel to sequel. Whereas other horror franchises, such as Halloween for example, 
vary in quality much more than Friday the 13th does. Even some of the worst movies still look and sound pretty good. Which brings me on to the soundtrack. It's good. Harry Manfredini once again returns to score this movie, and he always delivers this baseline of good quality soundtracks. Now, before we wrap up, there is just one thing I haven't mentioned yet, which is how the movie ends. Which is by Tommy having a vision of the real Jason, then he puts on a hockey mask, and the movie implies that he's going to be the next Jason-like killer. And this ending is fine. I have no problems with it. Hell, you could have fun with the next one. Because then you would have a killer who could potentially be talked down. Then we could have a nicely written Fall of Tommy Jarvis story. Ending with his redemption where he drops the hockey mask and recovers. But then a twist. The real Jason Voorhees comes back. And he has to kill him all over again. Then we could get some kind of new Jason on old Jason fight sequence. And that sounds really cheesy and like a lot of fun. I mean, it's not the only option. I'm sure there are others, but if you ask me, that sounds pretty awesome. But in any case, it wasn't what they ended up doing. They just bring Jason back from the dead in the next movie. Although Tommy does still fight him, so we still get that. So. That's nice. So all in all, Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning, is just more of the same, with a who's the killer mystery thrown into it. That is, if you're not me and actually consider the possibility that Jason was dead. So that's about it, really. You have been watching Good or Bad, and I will see you next time.